Scripture believes that we as humanity can go back and fix the trillion lines of code that are relatively insecure right now. Who believes that mankind has that ca capacity in engineering? I do. Everybody else, get the fuck out. <laughs> Pardon me? Uh, uh, hey, I'm not, I'm, I'll let the academics figure that one out. I just believe, look, we built the pyramids. We sent people to the moon. We've done so much as mankind together. I believe that if we approach this problem like disciplined engineers, that we can write secure software. Or at least put it this way. We have to write secure software if we want to continue the technical evolution that's benefited mankind. So I'm a member of OWASP. OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project. It's an open source and uh, open content foundation that focuses on web and other application security projects. My name is Jim Manico. I'm on Twitter at, at Manicode. Please tweet away and say hello. I always love that. And um, I do various things in the world of secure coding. But first, what's OWASP? OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project. It's a 501c3, that's a not-for-profit charitable organization. We have an entity in Belgium as well. Our mission is just to make application security topics visible so people and organizations can make informed decisions about application security and writing secure software and doing assessment around application security issues as well. And so this project is the OWASP Top 10 Proactive Controls, one of the projects that myself and Jim Bird, Jim Bird is another uh, programmer manager who works on a stock exchange in Canada. So we're talking really high assurance programming. And so we have 10 categories that we think you as a developer should focus on. And look, there's 11 categories and 12 and 13. This, is, this introduction is meant to bring you basic awareness to application security. It's not the end, it's the beginning of what you should read first. So I say read this document, go through this presentation once and then discard it and we'll, look at, we'll, we'll point to some other references that are more detailed for further study and work within application security. What do you think is the number one most important defensive topic in secure coding. Or what's the, how about this? What's the most important secure coding technique in applications, application security or at software development? The number one most important technique to build secure software. That's very close. That, that's like down the list two or three. There's a specialized form of input sanitization though, which I concern myself with. What's the, let's see if we can get there. What's the biggest vulnerability that faces a web and mobile app today? The number one most dangerous risk in an application. What's that? I'm sorry? What kind of injection do you think is the worst? What's that? Well, there's, there's a, several kinds of injection. There's LDAP injection. There's cross-site scripting, which is just JavaScript injection to client. There's, there's a command injection. There's SQL injection. What do you think is the most? See, I say SQL injection is the number one thing you want to deal with when doing secure development, especially when you're facing legacy code. The very first thing you should do, live legacy code that might be live and at risk, fix all your SQL injection problems. How do you fix SQL injection? There's only one absolute way to do so. What's that? What's the other half of that though? Prepared statements and, what's that? Stored procedures, we're gonna, we're gonna, that's not actually gonna help you because you can call a stored procedure and write a stored procedure that's full of SQL injection. So it's parameterized queries is the right answer. And there's two pieces to that, we'll get to that. So number one, when you're approaching application security for the first time, get all of your database queries parameterized. Who knows about this already and has and got this fixed already? It's a minority, it's a, it's a few more. So just real quick, here's the big cartoon that's famous in the security industry called Bobby Tables. <coughs> this is your son's school, we're having some trouble with his computer. Oh dear, did he break something? Well in a way, did you really name your son Robert, single quote, semicolon, drop table student, semicolon, dash dash? Oh yes, little Bobby Tables. Well, I, well, we've lost this year's student records, hope you're happy, and I hope you've learned to sanitize your inputs. Now, this cartoon is very famous in, in the geek security industry of application security. What's wrong with that slide, though? There's a misinformation. It's not about sanitizing your inputs. You can write perfectly SQL injection resistant code and never do input sanitization, just use parameterized queries. Go ahead. 
It's about it's about how, it's about how you use the how you put variables in the middle of a query safely. Let's look at that real quick. First of all, is this a legal email address? Better believe it is. It's RFC compliant email address. Gmail supports it. In fact, this is a Gmail domain, OWASP.org. Not only that, but the HTML5 email validator recommends a specific regular expression for email validation, and this passes. So you can have the best RFC compliant email address validation in the world, and that's gonna be accepted. And it's, and it's dangerous. What does a single quote do in the middle of a SQL statement? It's, it, it bounds a string. What does dash dash do? It comments out the rest of your query. So look at this perfectly valid email address. If you, to, if you do input filtering, or if you do input sanitization, it leads you to this. Here I have a new email address from the request, and I'm gonna drop that email address in the middle of a query. It leads to this. So it's just, I'm just updating that user's email address. They went to their edit profile, they hit update, and they put in this new email address. So the new email is this dangerous but valid email. Dangerous but still valid email. So here's the final query. Update users, set email as quote quote, and then dash dash at OWASP.org. The dash dash comments out everything, and you're left with that, which just updates the entire email feed column of your entire database to empty. So this is the misinformation. A lot of people still try to write these complex validation rules to look for attacks, and it's a path to failure. Historically, it's a path to failure. This is the most important slide in all of secure coding because it's PHP, and PHP is by far the most common language driving the web today by a long shot. And this is using the PHP PDO library where these are just placeholders, new email and user ID, and these are the bind statements to bind variables into a prepared statement. So it's using parameterized statements and binding every single variable you put into that query. This technique also makes your code run faster because your queries get pre-compiled. And that's how this defense works. A lot of people misquote how this defense really works. It works at the database level, not at your code level. Your code just instructs the database to operate that query in a very specific way. So step one, you'll send the placeholder query right here into the database. And by doing so, the database will compile that and build a query plan for that query. In step two, the actual variables will be sent into that query, but the query plan's already built. There's no way to change it at this point, so injection's just impossible. So it's not encoding, it's not validation, it's depending on the database to pre-compile your queries so attacker data can't modify it. And this technique is, is old school. We have this in the .NET world, we have this in Java. Even those of you doing NoSQL databases, a lot of you talk to Mongo through Hibernate, that's injectable, and you have to do parameterized queries there, even Perl. You know, the oldest language driving the web, we have parameterized queries. We have our question mark placeholder, and we have our bind statement, and injection goes away, and your queries run faster. So that's, that's number one. And if you don't have this dialed in in your organization, if you don't have this problem fixed in your organization, I recommend you stop what you're doing, fix all SQL injection, and then move on as a first step to assurance, because it's gonna be one of the easiest problems to fix, it's gonna give you a, a chance to test your ability to actually fix code. It's a great first step when approaching this problem for the first time. So, secure coding technique number two, and this is now encoding. What, what's the whole point of encoding? The whole point of encoding is to take data, escape it or encode it to a different form that's not gonna be executable with, while still preserving that original content. So let's, let's talk about that. So, now, the main attack that we see that's gonna need good encoding is cross-site scripting. This is, a, again, a common JavaScript injection attack. Um, the attacker logs into your web application, updates their profile, dumps this JavaScript into their profile, and then goes emails the administrator and say, hey, admin, my profile's not working. Can you look at it? So the admin looks at your profile, and this JavaScript executes. There's an infinite number of scenarios where an attacker can get JavaScript into your application in some way. Now your job is anytime a variable needs to go into the user interface, you wanna escape it. And by escaping it, you convert it to a form that still looks the same, 
but doesn't actually execute as JavaScript. So here's a couple JavaScript attacks. And look at the first one here. The first one, again, I update my profile, add this attack to it, and then some other victim is going to look at my profile and execute the JavaScript, usually while they're logged in. So I'm going to start by building script. I'm going to build a URL that's back to my site and include some data, the document.cookie. What's the document.cookie when this lands in the administrator's browser? It's their, it's their session cookie. This is how we hijack an administrator's account by guessing or stealing their cookie. And this attack, I would just look at my logs in manico.com. I would see this come in, and now I have the session data for that administrator, and I can take over or hijack their account. At the bottom here, this is simple virtual site defacement. JavaScript gives me full control of the page, and I'm just overwriting the whole page to say, go OWASP. So these are some basic but real world attacks we have to deal with. And so with JavaScript injection, with cross-site scripting, we can do so many dangerous things like we can scan that local network, we can undermine cross-site request forgery defenses, we can load scripts from third parties, steal any data from the page. This is a very big deal. Who did we just see get hit with cross-site scripting very recently? We just saw a major cross-site scripting attack in the last like two or three days against a major financial. I'm not going to mention them now, but happy to discuss it after, after this. What does your browser think that you're trying to do when it sees this character? If I like edit my profile and put this character in and it gets to the browser, what does the browser think of this character? It's an HTML tag. Does the browser think of this character as code or as display data? It's code. How do we put this character in the browser so it's display data? What's that? What's the, what's the encoding for this? And that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a partially right answer. We're going we're to drill down deeply. But you're right. Here's one of many kinds of encoding for that character. It's the HTML entity. When the browser gets ampersand LT semicolon, it displays the less than symbol without actually executing it as a tag. So this is a big deal here. And what we need is an encoding library. We need some kind of library where not on input, not deep in your controller, but as you're building the user interface, while you're building the UI code, and think of what your UI code is. It's a bunch of markup, a bunch of JavaScript, and slots where you put in variables that are, from, that are driven from the user and from the database and all these different things. When you put these variables into the user interface, that's where escaping is best. That's where you want to convert that, that output from a potentially dangerous context to something that's safe by escaping it. And these escapers are built into every major language now. We have the oldest one, that's the anti-XSS library from the .NET world. We have the OWASP Java encoder from the OWASP Foundation, relatively well-maintained project. And it's a very high performance project. And here are all the different functions we need to do the escaping properly. It's actually quite a few. Now you, you have all these different, if you're making XML in the client for old school Ajax, you have these older XML encoding, you have HTML encoders, style encoders, JavaScript encoders, and URL fragment encoders. These are the majority of what we need to write secure software in the user interface. And this encoding library, or a format of it, it exists in pretty much every language. Right? We have Ruby on Rails with a built-in encoder from Ruby on Rails 4 and above. We have PHP with this, I like the Zen framework encoder is well written. For Java and Scala, we have the OWASP Java encoder for .NET anti-XSS, and Go is a special case. Go is awesome, by the way, in my opinion. Here's why. Part of Go, they have a template system. It's called the Go templates. Yeah, good name, good name. So Go templates, you don't have to actually do encoding. You just use their templates. And as long as you don't turn off escaping, it will automatically escape contextually in the right context. Because we need a lot of different encoding functions. It's not just encode for HTML. It's encode for HTML, encode for JavaScript, encode for HTML attribute. And we're going to require a different encoding function based on where we're putting data in the user interface. So Golang, uh, the Go language does this for you. This is why I have so much hope for the future, because I see all these components being written that do provide significant automatic security. I feel that's the future of application security. 
The other kinds of escaping you need to do would be for LDAP. If you're doing old school LDAP stuff, you have uh, different encoding functions in these libraries. You have command injection. Be careful here. There's XML encoding functions in the Java encoder. Anytime untrusted data hits a parser, we want to encode to stop injection. So number three, category three, is input validation. What's the, the basis for input validation? What's the main tool that we use to do proper input validation? A regular expression is the more, more common one, right? And so I'm not going to talk about that. That's pretty basic stuff. Any input entering your software should go through at least some kind of validation layer. In some cases, when I'm trying to support many, many languages, massive internationalization, this whole topic breaks down. So I'll just say it must be a printable character and it must be up to this length at max. That's the very minimal that you have to do. So that's doable though. What's, what, what gets more tricky <coughs> is when you have to deal with uh, HTML input. Here's an example. Everyone, anyone ever heard of tiny MCE before by any chance? There's a little widget. That you, it's a WYSIWYG editor. You put some cool stuff in it, bold, highlight, bullet list, colors. When you hit submit, what gets submitted from tiny MCE? Uh, uh, I'm sorry? It's encoded. encoded HTML. It's a big chunk of HTML that represents all that rich text. So if someone is sending a chunk of HTML to your server, and you now need to display this HTML to another browser, how do you do that safely? How do you validate that a chunk of untrusted HTML is going to be safe? Any idea? Would you, would you build me a regular expression that arbitrarily and safely parses all HTML5? No. No, no one's going to do that. It'd be like a 20-page regular expression. It would be inefficient. So we need to do something very special. We want to use some kind of HTML sanitizer tool. So in the Java world, one of the lead AppSec engineers for Google donated this project to OWASP. It's the OWASP HTML sanitizer project. It lets you build a programmatic policy and then sanitize arbitrary third-party HTML. So this, this special case actually comes up a lot these days where we're getting a fragment of HTML from a user or a fragment of HTML from a partner and we never want to trust that. We want to run it through some kind of HTML sanitization engine. In pure JavaScript, we have the Kaha project from Google. In Python, we have the Bleach project. In PHP, there's the HTM Laud project. In .NET, there's the HTML sanitizer that was forked from Mike Samuel's project. Ruby on Rails, built-in sanitizer. Java, the one I just described. So there is some kind of HTML sanitizer for every project, every language, and we definitely need to use them when managing untrusted HTML. It's a special case that comes up pretty frequently. All right, now, other kinds of input validation that's difficult is file upload. I'm not going to discuss this in detail now. I'll leave the slide for you to read later. But when you let people upload files to your server, especially in the PHP world, lots of dangerous things can happen. There's multiple steps of security we have to consider. So let me charge on here. Next, category four of things to worry about. Next is going to be access control design. We heard a lot of good talks on access control, or we will. But a lot of them are more up to stack. They're design philosophy. I want to talk about access control from how you, as a programmer, add an enforcement point into your code. So let, let me ask you this. You're in code. Let, let, let's admit you're, you're at work. You're coding away, listening to some nice rock music, whatever they're listening to. And now you have to do access control. What are you going to put in your code to check if the user has permission to run that feature? What do you tend to do today? What's that? User rights. Like, what do you mean by, like, what would your code look like where you're doing a check? check I'll get you started. If? User yeah, if user has a role of admin, let them do it. And, this, and you have this check all over your code, right? You have hundreds of these checks everywhere in your code. Does that sound familiar? And my, my, what I say is never do that ever again. Hard coding roles, I feel, is a great anti-pattern that leads to very weak and hard to maintain security. Because now your actual policy 
is hard-coded and scattered throughout your code. So if someone's trying to audit your software or review your software, and they say, well, what's your access control policy? What's your answer? Uh, just go read the code, it's all there. That doesn't really work so well. I really wanna see your access control pushed to a database, and there's also the issue of multi-tenancy. Anyone here familiar with the term multi-tenancy? Suppose you have a web portal, and, and you, it's like a famous stropewaffles.com, very important site, and you have all these customers buying stropewaffles and everything is good. And you have all these role checks built into there as well. And let's say another customer comes to buy a Belgian beer company and they say, we love your website. We want a copy of your website for our beer company. And now you have two sets of access control rules to support, where if the customer is beer, then only an admin can do this. Or if the customer is throw awful, then um, only a manager or an admin can do this. That's what I mean by multi-tenancy. When you have one portal or one application that supports many customers with different access control rules, and it breaks down. Let me, let me explain this in the context of Star Wars. This will help, Star Wars always helps. Suppose we're building a Star Wars video game. You have Jedis and you have all oh, spaceships. You have like different warriors in the game. And I wanna check to see if the user is allowed to wield a lightsaber, the weapon of this, uh, sword of this game, right? So if the user is a Jedi, or if the user is a Padawan, or if the user's role is Sith Lord, or if the user's role is a Jedi killing cyborg, whatever. So every different kind of user, I'll have to go and change this code maybe in thousands of locations. And if I have like multiple different games from the same code base, I'm gonna have to fork my code or add different switches in for every customer. Because maybe Disney bought Star Wars, right? So maybe I have to make this a Mickey Mouse game. And maybe, you know, if the user is role, mouse, and I have to have all different roles. I want to be able to support the same access control system with multiple rule sets. That comes up a lot in my work, at least. So instead of coding to the role, code to the permission. If the user is permitted to wield a lightsaber, then you look up that permission look up the roles, and different customers can have different rules. So if you look at the original NIST standards for role-based access control, they recently released a new standard called ABAC, Attribute-Based Access Control. And this defense right here, is, this kind of coding is the heart of how you build a more modern attribute access control system. And here's one that's data-centric as well. We see the user's gonna try to drive a Winnebago, drive a motorhome. So we grab the ID of the item they're trying to edit, and they say, if the, or drive, if the user is permitted to drive Winnebago of that number, let him do it, else reject. Now, the benefit of this is I have a permission which lets me have different rules for different customers, and it lets me be data specific. I'm just asking about one piece of data in my system, not a general category. So shifting to a permission-based access control system, especially for large, complex software with multi-tenants, is fundamental today. So number five, establish authentication controls, Ident basic identity. And this also comes up a lot in, it comes up every day in secure coding. Before we get too far ahead, the first rule of authentication security, unless you have a really good reason, you should not be touching that code. Not, like if you have a team of programmers, I often see everybody checking in authentication code, fixing it here, fixing it there. This is a fundamentally bad idea. You should have your lead architect, your most skilled developer, whoever is the best security engineer, they should work on authentication and roll that out to everybody else. I think same with access control engines as well. This is such a difficult piece of code to get right. It requires a great deal of security sophistication to get this right. Make sure that you have, if you're touching that code, you better have a good reason, and there better be several checks along the way as well. Fair? One of the biggest kinds of attacks that we've seen against authentication layers in the last couple of years has been password theft, where the attacker steals a database, or does SQL injection to steal data, or some other attack where they're able to scrape data out of your web database and analyze it offline. Like one of the, one of, uh, happened to Sony, happened to LinkedIn. LinkedIn had their password storage system stolen in some way, and we found out that LinkedIn had MD5 for all their passwords. 
What do you think of MD5 for password storage? What's that? Sad face. I'm sorry? Oh, sad face? I didn't mean to make you sad. I'm sorry. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be OK. We have a solution. Don't worry. Don't be sad. We're gonna, it's going to be OK. So the kind, of, the kind of tools that attackers use to a, a, attack your password storage system, again, just to, just to clarify, they're not attacking your website directly. They've already successfully attacked your website, or they bribed someone to steal their database backup, and they have all of your database data offline in their laboratory. Now they can use like an open source tool like Hashcat, some commodity PC hardware like we see here. This PC has like seven different video cards in it to do a lot of floating point computation. Guess how many like hashes we can do per second with about 5,000 euro worth of hardware resources? How many hashes can I do per second? What do you think? Go higher. What is billions? It's more like it's like 500 billion hashes per second. That's a lot of hashes. That's why hashes are such a bad idea for password storage, because when the attacker steals your database, they can use cheap hardware to make many, many guesses to crack the system. And when doing password cracking, I need like 20,000 attempts to crack most accounts. So when LinkedIn was hacked, 90 plus percent of their passwords, which were in MD5, were stolen in the first hour. So we have to do something better. Let's, let's talk about what the solution is for password storage. Number one, do not limit the type of characters or length of a user password within reason. So what I mean by this is when, when the user is giving you a password, you should let them use a key, uh, a password manager, and give you giant passwords. Many systems are going to limit your password to like eight characters. Have you ever gone to a bank, had a bank say, we only accept eight characters? In the US, we've had that problem for years. I know you're a bit ahead of us here in Europe, but so uh, just a, a word of note, the Django framework from the Python world, they allowed unlimited size passwords in the past. Back, and, and this allowed easy denial of service. We could send one request in with one password that was like 10 megabytes in length and denial of service, the biggest Django servers that were out there. They limited the password size to 4,096 bytes, which helped fix the problem significantly. So number one, let your passwords be giant from your users, because we're going to use reduction algorithms that store them the same length in the database anyways. Step two, use a good salt. All that I'm trying to say, and the purpose of a salt is the same as an IV, an initialization vector. What's an initialization vector for? Anybody here study cryptography at all? What's an initialization vector for? What's the main purpose of it? You randomize your block cipher. I'm sorry? You randomize your block cipher. But why, but why does a block cipher need a different IV per message? Why is it used? What's that? So the attacker can't Well, the IV itself can be public. Let, let, me, let me just get into it. In AES, for a block cipher, we want to use we need to use um, an initialization vector different for every message. It's for one reason, to deduplicate ciphertext when plain text is the same. All it is is adding a little bit of string to your plain text before en encrypting it. It's really simple. Uh, assault is the same thing as an IV. You and I may have the exact same password. And then our ciphertext, our MD5 hash, will look the same. That's bad. It lets us attack that database easier. By adding a salt, a different salt for every user. Just like an IV, your IV should be a different IV for every single message. Same thing for users. A different salt for every user that's random. Attach it to the password and then protect it. Even when you and I have the same password now, the ciphertext will be different because we have a different salt. Cool. The third thing is, and I'll, is use some kind of slow algorithm. And it, there, it's a family of algorithms called KDFs, a key derivation function. It's not, a, it's not a hash, it's not encryption, it's a specialized function that takes a password, does some work, and returns a cryptographic key. The main, uh, the, you know, if you are a NIST fan, who's a, I love NIST, who's NIST fan, anyone, 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 NIST? Not in, not in Europe. <laughs> not so much around here, but that, that's OK. The, the main NIST algorithm to support US government and DOD is PBKDF2, Password Based Key Derivation Function 2. You give it the salt plus the password, and you give it a looping factor to purposely slow it down. Why are we slowing this algorithm down on purpose? 
Why are we slowing down our password storage cryptography on purpose? Hmm? Uh, I just, to, to, against brutal attack. Against, I, I agree, it's against a brute force kind of attack. But which kind of attack? Online or offline? offline. It's offline. Someone has stolen your database. They have all your password ciphertext. They now use a supercomputer, which is cheap, to do you know, 500 billion hashes per second. Now we use PBKDF2 with a very large work factor. Now they can only do like, you know, 50 or 100 tests per second. We radically slow down the attacker. You have three major choices. You have PBKDF2, Bcrypt, or Scrypt are three good key derivation functions to do good password storage. Anything like a hash is a bad idea. Encryption is bad because we can decrypt it. And so, let's jump ahead here. <coughs> One more note. Let's have a moment of security confessions. Security confessions is a great time during, during these sessions where we can find redemption and healing for our security errors, right? Are you ready to play uh, secure, uh, what are we playing in? Uh, uh, yeah, security confessions. Are you ready? How many people are working on a, a software system where this password would be accepted? Uppercase lower, lowercase letter, a number, and a non-alphanumeric character, a special character. Thank you for your honesty and for your, it's gonna help with the healing, don't worry. This is the most common password against standard corporate policy. It has an uppercase letter, it has a lowercase letter, it has a number, it has a special character, but it's uncommonly weak against a corporate policy. So the attacker can use a, brute, a vertical, now let me see if I got this right, a, uh, wait, vertical is up and down and horizontal. Yeah, they can do a vertical brute force attack and use one password attempt against all of your users if they know your usernames. So I want to suggest one more thing. Don't allow commonly used passwords. <coughs> a good place to research what are commonly used passwords today is a website called zato.com, x-a-t-o.com. They do a lot of good research, at least for US English centric passwords. Do your own research and I recommend you ban like the top 1,000 passwords within your system just to get the easy ones out of there. It's another additional defense to consider. And last note, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to um, uh, passwords, when it comes to your authentication layer, don't depend on passwords. You know, passwords didn't even work 15 years ago. They're not gonna work today. So we, we, we need to be using multi-factor authentication on everything. What am I looking at here? This is a game called World of Warcraft. Anybody play World of Warcraft before? <laughs> Nobody? You, have you played World of Warcraft before? <laughs> yes? Are you healed now? Are you done with it? I am. Let me ask you a question to prove that. Have you deleted your character? You are fully healed then. You are redeemed. Good man. And so, early, uh, if you look at the game World of Warcraft, back a few years ago, it was a $300 million a month economy. The, the company made a lot of money on this. And they were getting a lot of fraud against their famous players, the guild masters, the leaders of the game. They were getting their, their, uh, hack, they were getting their accounts hacked and all their equipment stolen. So Blizzard implemented multi-factor authentication. It's the first consumer service to roll this out for millions of users. Still works today. And this was to stop brute force attacks, online attacks. <clears throat> and so I highly recommend multi-factor authentication is nothing special. Just do it for every application. It's pretty easy to build today as well. One more note. One more note is how to do forgot password while we're talking about authentication in a few angles right now. How do most people do forgot password in a website or web application? Go ahead. Annoying stupid uh, security questions. Security questions or what else? What do they send you? A link in email, yeah. a password reset link where if someone clicks that link, they can reset your password. How secure is email as a protocol? All US and European banks, they will, if they're following the local laws, they will never use email to communicate sensitive information to you. It's against the FFIEC, the US banking laws, it's against German banking laws, against, I believe, some EU banking laws. We should never use email. You want to assume that your user's email is fully compromised, especially if you're a bank. So we recommend a forgot password workflow that's multi-factor. 
Well, the, the user, the user uh, says, I forgot my password. <clears throat> here's my account number, or here's my, uh, here's my credit card number, or here's my social security number, my identity ID. Then, optional step, ask a security question. There are no such thing as good security questions. But here's a, but as one of many steps, they don't do any harm. So there's a good cheat sheet choosing and using security question to assist with this. This is an optional step. If you don't want to do it, I think that's very acceptable. It is an optional step to consider. So the user entered their account number. The user entered their uh, credit card number. And now we want to generate a token out of band, either SMS or a click client in the phone or whatnot. And then they enter in that token in the same session. And then they're allowed to reset the password. A lot of people do password reset links. They're extremely weak. I recommend you do multi-factor also before a forgot password workflow as well. Another thing to consider when doing authentication layers is do re-authentication in several different locations. So if we look at here, we see that Amazon, we see Meetup, we see Twitter, we see Facebook, and I'm just trying to change my email address, and they're making me log in again. Why? Exactly. What if, the, what if the attacker changes your email? What can they do with that? <clears throat> uh, well, they can still uh, they can change your email because they need your passwords. No, I mean, if your website allowed an attacker like this to change your email address, so they can just uh, change email address, request the passwords. Because Boom. You lost it, and then they can send get a new one. Exactly. So I recommend you do re-authentication <clears throat> at login time when you're trying to change a password. When you're trying to do the forgot password workflow, when you're, I'm sorry, when you're, when you're uh, doing a significant financial transaction, there are many places in an app where you know, any major admin transaction where you may, may want to consider doing re-authentication against that feature. It's a very powerful control. It's not used very much in most applications, though, but it's something we've known about for decades. And you know, obviously, authentication is an extremely big topic. It's a giant topic, and there are multiple cheat sheets that talk about different aspects of authentication excellence. Authentication, password storage, forgot password, session management, and, and there's also a bunch of uh, guidance in the ASVS standard, which I'll talk about in just a moment. So authentication is a giant topic. I'm just mentioning a few different areas to concern yourself with. So how does your, let me ask you, does your boss want you to write secure software? In theory, yes. How does he message that to you? Does he give you specific requirements around what secure software means? Ever? In most cases, I've seen, work, I work with developers, <coughs> the business says, we really want you to write secure software. And then the developers say, well, what does that mean? And the company's like, you know, just make it secure. This is craziness. Those of you who are new developers, <clears throat> does your company ever give you requirements? Has anybody here in the world of engineering heard of requirements before? We don't do it that much anymore. But I, th I think it's because we're getting more agile. We just move fast, forget the documentation. Just go, code, code, code. When it comes to security, that's something that's very new for many of us. When, it, when, when we're familiar with making a web application, we can go fast without requirements. When we're talking about areas that are new or difficult, requirements become incredibly important. Now, there's an OWASP project called, again, the OWASP. Application Security Verification Standard. This is a, it's an, on version 2.0. This is a list of 196 requirements around application security broken into three tiers and 10 different categories. So now you have a rich set of requirements to start with, <clears throat> and you should fork off of this for your specific company. And now you have a list of 100 or so requirements specific to what you're trying to build. Why is this so important? Because most developers are still new at security, yet the company demands it, so they're figuring it out on their own. Give them a specific list of what needs to be addressed. And now you're no longer talking about this amorphous idea. You're talking about specific features that need to get built. And now you're on the path to really writing secure software. And so for ASVS, there's like three layers of application requirements. 
There's three tiers of session management requirements. Again, it's a great starting place to build your own application or company's security requirements. So now we have a common set of knowledge to discuss among our teams. Again, right now it's just, you know, usually people flopping around trying to write secure code. I want to turn this back into engineering and less into, you know, agile or whatever that means. So far, so good, everybody? Any questions so far? So let's talk about data protection and privacy. Uh, other people will be talking about this today. In fact, uh, um, on Friday, uh, uh, one of the speakers will be talking about HTTPS hands-on in great detail. If this topic interests you, uh, consider going to that talk. It's on Friday, I believe. <clears throat> I'm sorry? Oh, it's right here. Oh. <laughs> Oh, great. So what benefits, why do we use HTTPS? There's three reasons. We get confidentiality. That means the attacker can't view your data. The adversarial attacker on your network can't see your data anymore. We get integrity. That means the adversarial combatant can't change your data. And we get authenticity. When you're visiting a certain web server, you know for sure that's the right web server. Which system deals with that though. Which system, uh, which system in the world today validates that your server is the right server to your browser users? SSO. What are they called? SSO. What are, the, what are they called though that, that manages that authenticity? There's a, it's not you. There's a, another entity that needs to verify that your SSL certificates are valid. What are they, what are they called? C certificate authorities, right? In fact, if we go look at the browser today, let's go check it out. If we go look at the browser today, let's go to really quickly go to preferences and look at certificates, view certificates. These are all the certificate authorities that your browser supports. Depending on the browser, it's one to 500 authorities. This is the public certificate for every authority. So when you want to get HTTPS dialed in, you take your public cert, bring it to an authority, and they'll sign it with their private key so when that cert reaches your browser, they'll verify it with the public key, and now we know that website's authentic. This system, the CA system, is garbage. It is crap, and it provides horrifically bad assurance, and we need to move away from it. But that's going to take a long time. That might take decades to move away from the authority system. So we're stuck with this awful piece of trash system with very low integrity providers to provide authenticity on the web today. And this is a major problem what can you do with it? So first of all, when you're trying to get TLS configured properly, this is difficult. We have the uh, transport layer protection cheat sheet from OWASP. There's also <coughs> this very good guide from Ivan Ristic, the SSL Lab's best practices to help you configure your own servers. There's also the Mozilla configuration guide. It's not on here, but there's a great guide from Mozilla, which is the main guide I recommend today. I'll give you that link after class if you'd like. And so how do we get HTTPS correct? In the face of rogue authorities, what do we do? We have certificate pinning, strict transport security, forward secrecy. Those are the three main ones I'm going to talk about quickly. You you'll, can hear more about this on Friday, but strict transport security is a response header sent to the browser that tells the browser they must use HTTPS for that specific domain. And you can even preload the HSTS headers into Chromium. You can go to hstspreload.appspot.com. You can specify that you want your website hard-coded into Chrome and Firefox, that you want them to be HSTS enabled. So even the first hit leaving the browser will be HTTPS. And this is fantastic. This is now we're talking real security. Even the first request leaving the browser will be HTTPS. And normally, you make a request to my server over HTTP. Then I send a 302 redirect and redirect you to HTTPS. What's wrong with that? This is the way the web works. Go ahead. Yeah, if I'm an attacker on your network and I see the first HTTP request, it's game over. I got you. I'll inject JavaScript, I'll man the middle you, and I'll make it look like you're on HTTPS, but you're not really. So we have to avoid that first hop. This is what the preload initiative is all about. It's, it's new, but it works. I got my own sites in that preload list today. I highly want you to consider it if you really want even the first hop to be switched to HTTPS. 
The other problem is that authorities are so horrific. I mean, I could go on about the, the sins of the authorities for, for, for like a day straight. There is no healing or redemption for the authorities. They have sinned. They are doomed to security hell. I'm sorry. So what can we do in the face of the system? We can do something called certificate pinning. And this is a new technique, especially on the web. We can basically do one of two things. We can take our certificate of our public server that's been signed by a CA and hard code it in the mobile app. And then when that app makes a request to start SSL or TLS, and they get back the public certificate of that server, if it doesn't exactly match what's hard-coded, then reject. Because what many authorities do is that, like, they'll either sell their private cert or their private cert will get legally given to a different individual for whatever reason. And, and so if anyone has a private cert to an authority and they're between you and that server, they can just make a fake certificate, sign it, and give it to you. It's not a real cert. It's fake but it's signed by a real authority. So your browser says everything is cool. And so we can use pinning to detect when that's happening. Um, as Levin told me like two years ago, there's the experimental IETF draft headers. They're, they're a little buggy in Chrome, but they're reasonable. So we can set uh, a hash to different um, keys within your, with your key to your server. That will be hard code. That will be saved in the br browser for a certain amount of time based on your Mac age. And then you can include all subdomains for your entire server. I don't recommend you turn these on yet. I recommend you turn them on in reporting mode. There's an additional API you can add to this response header that says, here's a URL back to my server. If anybody gets caught being man the middled, just for now, don't stop them. Let them keep working but send me a report back to my server so I have an idea of what's going on. I recommend that's how you implement pinning in the browser today. Because if you get this wrong, I mean, you can lock out your users for max age seconds, and <clears throat> there's still a significant number of bugs in Chrome and Firefox that make it tricky. But report mode is awesome. It's worth considering. And finally, we have browsers that are giving good error messages. You know, attackers might be trying to save information from Google.com for passwords, messages, or credit cards. And, uh, you know, if, if a user is going to still try to reload, there's no hope for them. This is pretty clear of a message that things are dangerous right now. And so one more note, and this is what really bothers me, is that pinning is not going to save you. There are plenty of ways to evade certificate pinning. We saw this attack just in the last couple of days, and that's called the Superfish attack. Anybody heard of this? It's just, just in the last couple of days. You've got to realize what happened here. Leveno, uh, Lenovo or whatever, they preloaded adware in, the P in, in their PCs before shipping them out to customers. This adware will install their own certificate authority root certificate into your browser, the public cert of that. And in fact, this adware had the private cert in there as well that you could extract pretty easily. And now once an attacker has put their own cert authority certificate in your browser, if pinning sees that your cert was signed by a local authority, they don't complain. They let it ride. Only if your cert was signed by another public authority will the browser complain. Because Chrome says, hey, look, we need to add our own root certificates to let companies you know, read, their, read, their, read their employees' email. We need to allow network scanning devices and data protection to scan your email. So when your boss hands you a laptop, from his company, he, and he puts his own certificate into it, he can man the middle, all your Gmail, all your banking, and they do. This is the way the browser works and always has. And so what this did was, and it was incredibly clever, the attack actually injected a new authority, and it allowed the attacker to in inject advertisements into even HTTPS traffic. It allowed the attacker to embed attack traffic even into HTTPS pinned sites like Gmail. And I think that's a big problem. The Google team disagrees with me. Uh, Brad Hill and the W3C disagrees with me. But I, I'm st when, when someone's reading my email, my Gmail, I don't care who it is. I want to know about it. And so the browsers do not agree. And I'm, I'm getting very disappointed in the browser security choices. They're getting better in a lot of ways, but we still have major problems today. Yes, sir? Yeah, it was in, uh, it was in Chrome was the primary problem. Uh, and Windows, it was Windows, Chrome, and Windows, because Chrome and Windows use the Windows store. Firefox has their own store that was not affected. You're right. It's exactly correct. But if you look at the details of how this happened, 
This, this, look, I don't get freaked out much anymore. I've been in security for a long time. I've seen all the ugly out there. This one really bothered me because it shows how weak even the best technique we have pinning is to stop man the middle. And man, someone gets access to your machine, they install one cert, they can man the middle of you. No matter what protections you put in play, they got you. So I don't know what to say. Proceed with caution. Use pinning, still do it, but realize it's not a savior. It's just one additional defense. Another thing about HTTPS is using uh, forward secrecy. Just real quick, when you're using forward secrecy ciphers, if I can steal the private key from your server and save it, I can now decrypt any traffic that that server ever made. <coughs> and so that's a big problem because in older versions of RSA, the actual symmetric encryption key was derived from the private key on the server. This is a major problem. And so when you have an ephemeral cipher suite, this is like the elliptical curve, Diffie-Hellman, RSA suite of algorithms, they, uh, they actually um, build a temporary key, an ephemeral key that's not related to the private key of your server. So even if someone has been recording your traffic for a long time and then they finally steal or guess your private key, they're no longer going to be able to, enter, to decrypt any of your traffic easily. But yet if an attacker steals your private key, they can still man the middle of you if they're live on your network. So these ephemeral cipher suites are going to help advanced adversaries who record traffic for the sake of decrypting it down the road. One more thing. For encryption and storage, we tend to want to use AES. We want to avoid ECB mode. We want to use the Glaus counter mode. And, but you know we're still kind of stuck in the CBC world for enterprise support. You need a unique IV per message. Don't forget to get your Oracle padding correct. And when you get that, that's just the right algorithm. You have to do good key storage and key management and isolate the actual crypto to a separate machine or process. That just gives us confidentiality. You've got to HMAC your ciphertext for integrity. Usually you want to derive your integrity and confidentiality, and confidentiality keys from the same master key and use a technique called labeling. And don't forget to generate a good master key from a good entropy random source and good luck with that. The chance of you getting this right is near zero. Some of the best applied cryptographers on the planet get this wrong. So I say don't do it. Use a library to do it for you. There's only two good crypto libraries on the planet right now. There's Google Keysar. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> get, ex get excited. Get excited. There's only two good crypto libraries, apply crypto libraries out there right now. There's Dan Bernstein's uh, um, NACL project with lots of hooks to Java and other languages. Then there's Google's Keysar project. Google recently tried to roll this project back and, and stop open sourcing it. And like immediately, like 20 people immediately made a GitHub fork and did an automatic script to grab it every day. But I don't know why. They said it was a, there's a licensing issue. We need, have, we need to have to re drop Google Keysar from the web flipped out. This is so good because all the things we need to care about, the padding, the IV management, all that junk is handled for you within this library with a lot of future proofing built in as well. So don't write crypto yourself. Really work with a high level library that does it right. And you only have two choices. Get NACL and, uh, and Google Keys are. Now, how, how are we on time, by the way, Levin? May I do a time check? Time check, sir. Pardon me? Oh, we're doing great. Any questions so far? Yeah, you were talking earlier uh, about uh, how the OCA system uh, isn't all that secure and who will. Ah, it's worse than that. No, 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 no. It's a piece of trash. That is a piece of trash, and it'll probably take decades to move away from it. Are there already alternatives? Better. Nothing reasonable. There's a, a, a Moxie Marlin Spike, a crypto activist and researcher. He built a, a system called Convergence that was trying to replace SSL authorities. It never flew though. It's a peer-to-peer -peer verification. So it's, you need to do pinning. That's the main thing. Especially the world's moving to mobile apps. Doing pinning in the browser is we only have the IETF headers, which are wonky at best. In a mobile app, though, you can hard code your public cert directly and flag on any problem. You can do really righteous pinning in the mobile app. So that's what I would focus on. For the browser, I would only do reporting because of how unstable these headers are. For the mobile app, I definitely would, would focus on this true, full-on um, um, pinning of the hard-coded version of your public cert. That's how you deal with this problem. And it doesn't matter what authority you use. It really doesn't. Who cares? Use whatever authority you want. Because <clears throat> it's not about that authority going bad. 
if any authority goes bad, they can sign your cert and man the middle you. So this question of using a good authority, it, doesn't, it really doesn't matter. Because again, if any authority goes bad that's in your browser, you're done. That's the way it works. Cool? Yep. All right, let's take a little, little water break, a little intermission, intermission. Any other questions so far? All right, number seven, let's talk about app layer intrusion detection. Here's a couple just quick little techniques. In the .NET world, when you apply a regular expression to a form field, it will give you input validation both in the browser in JavaScript as well as input validation server side, like normal input validation. This is a good idea. <clears throat> if you have really good client side validation and you have really good server side validation, how many server-side validation errors should you get? Let me ask the question one more time. If you have really good browser or client-side validation, and you have the same validation on the server, how many validation errors should you see on the server? What's that? Small to none. Because you're already doing it in the client. So for of course you can bypass the client. And here's the reason why I do it in both places. <clears throat> when, I see, when I have a good built application, a normal user can never send me invalid data. It's just not possible. But the attacker, using a proxy, can do it easily. So when I see server-side input validation rules failing, I know I'm being attacked. So that's just a, it's called it's a basic kind of intrusion detection. Input validation failure server side when client side validation exists. It's easy to detect when an attacker does this, hence the de detection point for that feature. <clears throat> Number two, input validation failure server side on non-user editable parameters, like a drop down list or a radio button list, right? Think of a drop down menu, a, a menu of country codes. How many possibilities can be sent from that drop-down list. Exactly. What if someone gives you a choice that's not in your list? You're being attacked. Someone's using an intercepting proxy, or someone's infected with malware, and they're sending malicious data up to your server. So this should never happen by a normal user. Someone needs to be intercepting data after it left the browser and changing it in some way. Or they're using a browser plugin to manipulate data, right? Here's a fun one. Do you know what, ro you know what robots.txt is used for? Someone, what do you use robots.txt for? Well, to ask any search engine not to index your site. So suppose you're an attacker and you look at my robots.txt file and you see me say disallow admin secret login.jsp and I say don't index my secret login page. Is robots.txt hidden? It's a public file. So you're a hacker, you see my robots.txt and you see me disallowing the super secret login.jsp. What are you going to do as a hacker? Go look at that page right away. And you see a login page, that's all. What do you do there? <coughs> Start throwing some tools at it or trying to attempt to crack in. And so in my code here, secret login.jsp, that's not a real endpoint. No other user can see it. It's only linkable through robots.txt. When an attacker hits that page, all it does is it takes a login request, does a random five to 10 second delay, and says, you know, login failed. And then it pages me to tell me that I'm being attacked. So a, it's, got, it's, a, it's a honeypot, it's a trap. It's easy to build and it gives me early intelligence when I'm being attacked. Because most of the best attackers I know, they'll go hit robots.txt as their first hit and use that to do, uh, um, to case the joint, to, do, uh, to, to view the details of the app. So that's an easy trick that's worth considering, right? Uh, another one fun thing is when I'm building a shopping cart, I, I always put the price in the form of a shopping cart. Now you're an attacker, and you see my shopping cart, and you see the price as a variable, what are you gonna do? You're gonna change it. And so what my code does is it has the item ID, it looks up the shopping cart item, it sees if the price is still the same, if not, lock the account. So again, these are, these are like uh, intrusion detection points and honeypot points to stop attackers when they try to do malicious things that a normal user could never do, cool? 
And in the Java world, at least, there's this great tool called the OWASP App Sensor Project. It's a Java project for Java apps. It lets you easily embed different intrusion detection points in your code base and set bogeys around when you do alerts and stuff like that. A very powerful tool. Version 2.0 was just released recently. A gentleman named John Melton's the lead architect for us. Great, great developer. So there's a couple tricks for intrusion detection that are worth considering. Number eight, any, any questions? Any questions? Someone make up a question. Anyone? No questions. All right, we'll keep going. So number eight, I don't have any slides on this. This is just a, a general catch-all category. Leverage the security features of frameworks and security libraries. When you can avoid it, don't write it from scratch. If you know of a good, well-vetted security control, then use it. And you know, I, I see a lot of teams that are addressing security for the first time. And developers are running wild, everybody's picking different libraries, and now your security controls are not standardized. So if you're using, if you're using Spring, there's a, a really good built-in authentication layer. There's good escaping routines. If you're using uh, um, Ruby on Rails, there's a lot of built-in script, uh, built-in cross site scripting defenses. So all I'm saying is have what you consider to be secure controls to be standardized in your organization so there's not this waste of every developer trying to figure out their own way of writing secure code. Other key thing, I mentioned this before, is security requirements. More and more security requirements. And I, I don't think that requirements are always a good idea. When I have a mature development team that's already expert in the language and they have good agile processes in place, you know, requirements are a lot less important. When we're dealing with security for the first time, it's a very complex topic, and we need to communicate these complex engineering tasks to different teams. Requirements are fundamental to that communication. And guess how many people actually do security requirements in their teams today? Almost none. So I really want to bring this back into the world of engineering because it, you can't just flop around and write secure code. It needs to be a disciplined approach especially today as we're very new about this topic in the world of software engineering. And like I mentioned before, the place to start with security requirements is the OWASP application security verification standard. I'm not saying just use this. I'm saying steal it, it's open source, and fork from it, specific to your company. There's a whole mobile section. Maybe you're not doing mobile, remove it. And now you have like 100, 150 very clear requirements to facilitate communication between engineering and management and security. This is such a basic idea, but nobody does it for whatever reason. I want you to consider it to bring some discipline back in what you're doing. And this is not going to be, uh, this is still a very efficient process. I'm not saying, you know, it's something we can do in a couple hours. Get your architects, go through this list, see what matters to you. And now you have a good starting place to define what security is. That's key. We want to define what security is, not hope that we get security from our developers. Is that fair? I know it's not exciting, but it's very important, super important, especially for big teams in management. All right, last but not least is security architecture and design. So, I mean, there's multiple talks on threat modeling and on different kinds of upfront review. I don't want to get too deep into this, but the idea here is, is we want to get our business, especially when you have banking software and very complex workflows like an insurance application, we really need to get the business, the technical, and security stakeholders together so everybody's on the same page, again, around what security means to this application. Especially in banking, there's a lot of offline fraud analysis workflows that are important that interact with your software. We need to get all that stuff right. And the other thing we want to do early on in the de design phase is to have functional and non-functional requirements put in place. Why? Because if you have a functional requirement, that's something QA can test. If you have a non-functional requirement, that's something using the security professional to test. It lets you break up the duties of assurance into different teams. And one, one more example about design, it's state. So think about, uh, think about account lockout, right? <clears throat> And I have a variable, a login failures. Why would I use that? Why do I have a variable login failures that I'm tracking for a user? Yeah, so after like maybe three, four, or five failures, we'll lock the account. 
Where should we store that variable? In the request as a hidden variable? In the session of the current active session? In the database? Why not the session? You might be able to modify the might be able to modify the session. Let's be specific. Um, I log into your server, you give me a session cookie and activate your session on the server. I start logging in now to your server. What as the attacker do I need to drop or delete from my request to ensure that I'm never attached to your server side session? What do I need to delete from every request? Yeah. Exactly, just delete the cookies. And boom, every request is a new session. So we have to put login failure into the database so it's persisted and acted on by every incoming request. That's what I mean by state here. And not a lot of security folks talk about it, but we have to make sure that we're using state in a web or mobile app correctly. It's either the request as a hidden variable or some data we're passing back and forth. It's the session, like a cross-site request forgery token and the database for things we must persist, like the number of failed logins. And these decisions have dramatic security implications. They're not talked about enough, but if you work with your developers, it's a very easy conversation to have during the design phase. One more thing I want to mention is <clears throat> like trusting input. And there's a couple debates on this. What is untrusted input? I'll give you a couple different perspectives. What, give me a definition of what untrusted input is all about. That's one definition. Keep going. Anyone else? How about any data from the request? That's another common one. Those are what most security pros will tell you. Any data from the request is untrusted. Don't trust it. I'm going to give you a whole new definition. It's going to blow your mind. Are you ready? You know what data is untrusted? All data you're processing. Every variable you're processing, especially ones that are strings. If you have a numeric type, you can control that input. But if you have an open string anywhere, treat it like it's insecure, and you will forever be writing more secure code. You write a function, and you have strings going into it. Some people will say, well, let's go up the stack and see how it gets into our system. I say, don't even bother with that. Write your individual functions with your parameterized queries and validation, whatever defense you need. Treat every string like it's untrusted, and that will lead you down a path of writing much, much more secure code, right? And so if I'm looking at like banking software, this is a comment from Jim Bird. His software is so complex, it's a stock trading application. I mean, it's the stock exchange of like Canada or something like that. And so like uh, they have such specific requirements around performance if things are delayed for a fraction of a second, millions are at play because it's a stock market. So they, in some tiers of their system, they assume only secure clients can connect to it so they can provide better speed. And you know, this is something I, I, I hesitate to talk about, but in Jim's world, Jim Bird's world, this is his daily reality. We have to make sure that that trade finishes in 100 microseconds or, 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 or less. They may build a trusted network avoid some security controls there, and assume trust today is coming from a different system. This is very dangerous to do. This is all about tiers and trusting certain tiers, but it does come up. It is, worth, it is, it is something that will come up in design, and uh, be careful here, right? My philosophy is you build security in everywhere, and that's a luxury for some applications where at my data layer, <coughs> I'm usually going to add access control checks there. You know, at my business layer, I'm going to validate everything. And, and, you know, at my user interface layer, I'll encode everything. You know, I'm going to do, I'm not going to trust data anywhere in my system if I have the luxury to do that, right? You know, final note just about OWASP. You know, OWASP is uh, a charity. It's something that I'm very passionate about. I do a lot of volunteer work. I don't get paid by OWASP. It's just something I do as a volunteer. Again, our mission is to make application security visible. Everybody is welcome to participate. Everything that we do at OWASP is free. I, you know, if you really care about application security, and I hope you do, please consider uh, you know, contributing or using our work in some way. Hello. Okay, different browser. So I want to show you one last thing. There we go. So it's OWASP proactive controls. And if you're trying to 
message to developers what secure coding is. I feel this is a great project to start with. This is just, uh, it's the top 10 item I just talked about. It's a lot of different people helped build this and contribute to it. Again, it's meant as an initial awareness document only. And you'll see the, the list of details you can print out. There's a PDF that you can hand off to your development teams. And it's meant to be concise and easy to read just to get your devs started on really thinking about secure coding. From here, read it once and then throw it away. I highly recommend as your second pass, go we'll look at the OWASP ASVS project. Again, this is, in my mind, this is one of the most important projects from the foundation because it's gonna give you a, a really fantastic list on requirements that you need to care about. Let me show you how they're broken down. They're broken down by different categories, authentication requirements, you know, we have session management requirements, access control requirements, great. And they're broken into three tiers. Here's the easy things that everyone should get right. Here's the intermediate things to work on next, and here's the most difficult things to work on next. So it's gonna be broken up by security area, give you three tiers of issues to deal with, you know, one at a time, and it, it helps you build a standardized list of definitions of what security means to you, which I think is fundamental for the future. You know, right now, a lot of us, the bosses say, make it secure. Then you go to your boss and say, hey boss, what does secure mean? The boss is like, you know, I don't know, just make it secure. And that's a path to failure. This will help you have that communication gap filled with good knowledge. Cool? Any questions before we finish up? I hope this was of value to you in some time. If you have any questions for me, I am a Jim at OWASP.org, or I'm on Twitter at Manicode. I'm glad you were here. I hope it helped. Go forth and write secure code. Thank you very much, everybody. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? In addition to passwords, let's, how about that? Let's use SSL certificates in addition to passwords. Multi-factor, something you have, a certificate, something you know, your password. Both is better, not just one. Because a certificate will let me hit your network and see your app. The password lets me get into it. I, I have one, one uh, group I work with. They are an intelligence outfit out of the Netherlands. Um, and they build applications that provide computer hacking intelligence to big companies. They gave me a preview of this. They gave me a certificate first to identify me. Then I went and logged into the app and they made me set up multi-factor configuration through my phone through a text. So I have to have the cert to see the app, then I need a password, then I need multi-factor. Now we're talking authentication security. The SSL cert by itself is a very bad idea because someone steals the cert, they got full access to the whole system to, for that user. So do both. And even better, um, I don't want to manage that PKI though. It's called, I don't want to manage the certificates for every single one of your customers. No thank you. That's going to be the tough problem. Do you have 100 users? 1,000 users? 10,000? How many users do you have in your system? A million? 10 million? Probably around between 100 and 1,000. Between 100 and 1,000? That, that's doable to manage certificates. The best provider, uh, yeah. You're going to have a certificate management issue, but Theoretically, it's a very good idea. Just don't do certificates by themselves. Because if I steal it, I have the whole account. If I steal it, I should still need to have to brute force the password, and your code should detect that, stopping me from successfully attacking the system. Is that a fair answer? Yeah. Cool. Anyone else? Please. Can you think about zero knowledge uh, password based authentication? Zero knowledge password based authentication? I have zero. I have zero knowledge about that. Okay. Let's go. Let's look it up real quick. So you're saying? The keyword you want to look up is fake. What's it called? Fake. P A K E. Zero knowledge password proof. All right. So the idea is that the password is not sent from the client to the. Uh, oh, this where you're like you're you're sending a public key down to the browser. And you're encrypting the password before sending it to the server? Not quite. More Was that more more or more or less? More or less. All right. 
party from verifying guesses of the past without interacting with the party. I want to know what it, I want to, I want to research it more. The first method was encrypted key exchange described by Bellavin. Yep. Yeah, this is, I, I've read Bellavin's paper on this. So yeah, this is about, I, my understanding is you're never letting the password be on the wire for any reason. You're using some form of advanced cryptography on the client to encrypt the password or, or use some other protection algorithm the password in addition to being over HTTPS. Yes. This, is a, this is a good idea. So because H how good is HTTPS today? It is? Trash. It is trash. Exactly. So then anything you can do to protect you even when your HTTPS is violated is going to be a good idea. Right? And email me. I'll look into this in a bit more detail and give you a more intelligent answer. Right? Any other questions? Well, you've succeeded in being here for day one. Thank you so much. Get some rest tonight and uh, get ready for another lovely day of secure coding education. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.